So yes, Canonical is the company behind Ubuntu. Ubuntu is one of the products that we have. I'll, I'll talk about some other ones. So what do we do? We make an operating system. We say it's freely available for you to use and share. Go and download it. But we get paid millions by some customers that I think you all know. How did this happen? That's what I want to talk about. Because this doesn't happen overnight, but you can make it happen as well. And open source is this like really, really, really interesting thing because you get like all these small companies using it. They give you feedback. They do crazy stuff with it. But do you know how who the first companies were that were using Ubuntu in the cloud? You probably know them. Netflix, Uber, Airbnb. The only thing is, when they were using Ubuntu, nobody knew who they were. And that's the key to what I want to talk about. So how do we make the BT procurement irrelevant? Well, we show things that the regular suppliers can't do. This is one of our uh, newer open source projects. And uh, what I'm going to show here, and you have to watch very carefully, is how you set up a telecom solution. So this is how you deploy it. Then you can go and like scale it out. You can like configure like where it goes on which servers. You can like change configuration. You can uh, disintegrate, you can integrate. And basically what I showed here in a minute is how you deploy, integrate and scale in minutes. It's a little bit faster than it runs in real life, like what you hear see in seconds will be like uh, minutes to an hour. But what we showed to telcos who were measuring integration time in months is that we measured it in minutes and it's open source and they can do it too. This specific solution was demoed in front of a live audience. It was basically combining the world of cloud and Google and Docker with the world of telco. We showed in 15 minutes, together with partners, how you could deploy what the telcos call value-added services, like conference calls and SMSs and so on, in front of a live audience, how to scale it out, how people could interact with it, um, how to deploy new applications in minutes. Nobody could do that of their regular suppliers. So what's happening now is you have the Telefonicas of this world that have adopted this as their base platform. They don't publicly say the name Juju, but it's part of their open source mano and it's now an Etsy project and so on. So it's basically we went around the bushes and got where we wanted. The other way. We, in our device part, IoT part, we made the solution to app enable any device. So we can put app stores on anything. And you can as well. That's the new thing. Anybody can run their own app store. You can take a device, put an app store on there, and others can then develop apps for it. You don't longer go to this world where you have a hardware box, you have an embedded operating system, you have an embedded software. It's all done by one company. Think the Cisco's of this world for networking. But then you don't like their logging mechanism, you don't like their monitoring, you don't like their backup, well, you're stuck. You have to go with what they said. What we've done is we just reapplied this paradigm and say like, what if there's an app store? You don't like the logging monitoring or backup, or you need this other protocol, or you need this cloud integration, just get an app for it. Just that simple. So on Mobile World Congress this year, we showed how that works for like home or, or, or small business networking. We even did mobile base stations. We had drones that were app enabled. We had 3D printers. We had enterprise networking and lots of other stuff. So what's our secret? Well, if you want to compete with somebody, like an oracle, don't compete with what they have today. That's never going to work. Small company can't compete with an oracle. You have to predict where the future is going, and then make an open source solution for tomorrow's problem. Because by the time tomorrow comes, it will be today. But you will have today's technology for today's problem, where your competitors will have yesterday's technology for yesterday's problem. That's 
as easy as it goes. So how do you know where things are going and why is that important? Well, most companies are not looking and then it goes horribly wrong. We live in a world where innovation goes so fast that like your super billion business goes away in years, disappears. Smartphone came in. Who still has an old Nokia here? They were 90 something percent of the market. Windows was 90 something percent of the market. Like, you don't have to go in Asian history. There's, there's lots of companies that get disrupted in two years. So, how can you predict the future? Well, there's something called value chain mapping. And the person that did strategy before I did strategy for Canonical came up with this, Simon Wortley. So what did he do? He made a value chain of like how things fit together. So if you want this supersonic drone cloud service, well, it needs at the bottom electricity that comes from a battery. All these things hang together. And then on the other side, you have like evolution. Something that is super, super new that like still comes from an academic paper to the complete opposite. Who still wants to make his own electricity? Nobody. It's a commodity. So what you now do is you bring those two together. And it becomes a map of where you have to go, a map of what will happen. There's things like compute that has moved from product to commodity and utility. That's called cloud computing. So if you're seeing that that's going to happen and you're an operating system, you don't focus on the product. You focus on what will happen if I now open source a cloud operating system. If I push this thing from proprietary to commodity, because what happens is there's this whole new thing that spins up. Netflix's, Airbnb's, Uber's, and all these things came because of the cloud, came because they didn't re have to reinvent everything. They just got an Ubuntu, they just got this, they just got a WordPress, they just got this other thing, and they were up and running in two days. What did it do for us? Well, Simon saw in 2008, Cloud computing was coming. He said, we need to optimize for this. 18 months later, we had 70% of the cloud market. And we stayed at that level. Because other operating systems weren't accustomed to the IP going away and another IP coming in just because this and that ch uh, change. Storage was, uh, was going away if you rebooted and so on and so on. Cloud was different. So you had to make all these tweaks to make it work but no customer asked for it. Because Airbnb, Netflix, Uber weren't really companies that like had a lot to say back then. So if you wait until your customer asks for cloud, then you're in the Oracle game. <gasps> I need to go to cloud. 98% now has to move to cloud and we're almost there. Yeah, but when the customers ask for it, Salesforce already ate your lunch. That's what the reality is about today. So this was a Wired article, The Walking Dead Techno Companies. I think some deserve perhaps a second chance, but like Wired was saying, these companies had the problem because they didn't go after cloud and mobile. They missed a cycle. They didn't look forward what's going to come. Another interesting uh, paper, uh, and this is British uh, intelligence together with Simon Wortley, is the Boiling Flo Frogs uh, paper. It's on GitHub. And it basically talks about the concept of if you have a frog and you have like a frying pan with like boiling water, you throw it in there, the frog jumps out. Take that same frog, take cold water, and slowly heat it up. By 40 degrees, falls asleep, by the time it reaches 100, you have boiling frogs. Organizations are doing that same thing. Oh, I'm BT. I have to like deliver faster with my product managers and so on. 
yes, yes, I'm going to make my own social network portal, um, app store, or whatever the telcos have tried the last years. The heat goes on and on and on, but like at this moment, you have WhatsApp and Hangout and, and so on, taking the two of the three main uh, revenue streams away, which is SMSs and calls. And we don't see a future in which data will be double as expensive next year for the same amount or something like that. More the other way around. And fiber to the home and 5G deployments, IoT to the data tsunamis will come at a cost. So you have to change things. Otherwise, you become boiling frogs. So I loved your comment there. So this is specifically about those corporations. Like they are in the sustaining innovation mechanism. They know how to get a landline out. They do that better than anybody else. But what if Facebook or Google come along with drones that give you connectivity? They're not that good at that type of models. So this is this disruptive innovation. It's how markets are now being disrupted. And it's easier now than ever to disrupt the big market than to create a new one. Big corporations are there to evolve, to, s to keep the status quo. They don't want things to commoditize. So Cisco's not looking into how to open source hardware because that commoditizes their business. That drives their margin out of where they currently have high margins. So it's a uh, display that is extremely interesting. So if you look at the future, what are things that are happening? We already saw that compute and software became a service. But other things are going to be a service as well. Uber is driving as a service, but the moment we have autonomous cars, we're not going to own a car anymore. Why would you? A car is 95% parked somewhere. That is capital that is not producing. That same car can drive around. You can have transport as a service at a fraction of owning a car. And that will change the car manufacturing industry, but it will also in, uh, change insurance for cars. If there's three companies in the world that offer three plans, the shared car, the private car, the luxury car, if there's a traffic jam, your cars move away, the luxury goes through. You don't need 500 insurance companies anymore. One or two will deliver service to those. So it's like all these disruptions that you have to predict where the future is going that can help you. Because if you make now an open source solution based on a future problem, then things change because when that problem comes along, nobody else has a solution. You have an open source solution. Nobody else gets budget to make a competing solution. So your solution becomes the standard. It's exactly the way we did it. Other major trends. This was hot some years ago. 25, 35, Raspberry Pi. It is as powerful, more powerful than the first Google servers. Google probably paid $35,000, $50,000 for that server. Now, it fits here. It has more and better specs. But they already made one that is like three times smaller, cost $5. Like, look at the trend. Where is this going? It will be $1 soon. It will be faster, cheaper, and so on. Like, there's things that are complete computers with everything for $9. Like here, you, at least you have to like buy some other things. This is a complete one. So this can now be put into this, can be put into like the air conditioning, can be put in that camera, can all have app stores. So what is going to be the future? Greenfield app stores, because there's not a lot of apps and projector apps yet. So if you make a good one, there's no other one, you probably are going to have a good deal selling it. So everything can now have its own app store. Another major trend, DeepMind, uh, deep learning. Computers now start doing things better than us. It's frightening, but it's real. It's being open sourced. Facebook, Google, lots of others. We are working on like 
open sourcing how to set up complete distributed learning infrastructure in minutes. So it's all those fundamental things on which you can then afterwards build. Another one of my favorites, smart contracts and Bitcoin and blockchain and so on. Who knows what the DAO did this year? Okay, so the DAO stands for Distributed Autonomous Organization. It's code that automatically does things for you, including payment. And what they made was like, what if we make a VC based on code? You basically put in some cryptocurrency, get some voting um, um, rights in return, and now people can propose things of what to do uh, around this type of technology, and if enough vote, you get the money. Was there were two problems with this. It was too successful because it was a 200 million crowdfunding project biggest in the world. In months, they raised 200 million worth of cryptocurrency. And then the second problem is, if you have very, very early code and you have 200 million behind it, and a thing that can like change even governments and banks and anything, because anything can be automated, stock exchanges, some people will hire the best hackers in the world to find a problem and it got hacked, and some money got stolen, and now they're like changing things. So new technology is sometimes bleeding edge. But more than this going away, it's like they got the best hackers to attack it. The next one probably will not be brittle. So this will change the world. Another one which Absolute things can also be done for wireless. So we did a... Um, uh, and a crowdfunding campaign together with uh, Lime Microsystems from Guilford about the Lime SDR. Just plug it in, put an app, and now you can like have this wireless protocol. Put another app, you can do another one. So you can have everything from like mobile LTE, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LoRa, whatever. But you can also invent your own. So basically, the GitHub generation can make a new protocol for IoT and put it out there and see if it works. So you don't need all this proprietary patent and all these like legal barriers anymore to be an innovator in wireless. Even governments, I was speaking in Estonia uh, some months ago and they have this like e-residency. You basically pay a hundred dollars, give your passport, have a picture taken uh, and a fingerprint and basically they now have identified your identity and they give you an e-residency card with a reader, strong crypto uh, cryptographics. You can now open a bank account, start a company, run a company, pay your taxes all online. They're making APIs for it and so on. So there's now people living in like countries where the law and economics aren't very good. They just run Estonian companies. It's not about evading taxes because they pay taxes. They have the system of like paying taxes to the other countries. It's about facilitating, generating businesses and new employment. One of the things I'm personally pushing is constructive innovation and the constructive innovator. What is this concept? It's about not going against the flow, but, and let me go to this one first, but helping big companies. A top innovator could go against a big company or could help a big company. It's better that you help a big company because if you give McDonald's or uh, any big brand, Coca-Cola, a new revenue stream, your solution the next day will be in countries you have never heard of. Both of you win. And why is this so easy to do? Because we are now getting to the era of software-defined hardware. This is a projector, but we put the Lime SDR in there. What is this now? Well, if you put a Wi-Fi app on there, it's your Wi-Fi point, so you don't need two boxes. If you put 4G app and you don't have coverage, it's just your mobile base station. But if you put another app, you can control a drone and you can see through the projector where it's flying and through a Bluetooth thing connected to your smartwatch, I can now go like this and chase my kids and it's an entertainment. 
it's not defined by the manufacturer. That's software-defined hardware. That's also very interesting for the open source hardware uh, people around here because you can actually make money by running app stores and getting revenue share from people that invent new use cases for your hardware. So if you want to be a disruptive innovator, go ahead. But like you're fighting against the banks. If you go to Coca-Cola and put like a cryptocurrency app on their Coca-Cola machine and people can now withdraw real hard cash out of the Coca-Cola machine and Coca-Cola get bitcoins, Coca-Cola will be happy. Why? If that Coca-Cola machine is in Nigeria, they have to have somebody perhaps drive for two days to get to that village, get the Nairas out, get through some hostile territory and exchange it at like a doubtful exchange rate. That is an enormous cost. With this app on there, if somebody just goes in and says, I offer you some uh, bitcoins, give me the Nairas, five seconds later, those bitcoins are in Atlanta and they can all be used for new transactions. So instead, and they get a commission for that. So instead of a cost, it becomes a revenue stream. The internet of revenue generating things. Think further, what can you do with apps? Well, take point of sale. So we already saw how you could convert a Coca-Cola machine into an ATM. But you could also do money, deposit, uh, money deposits, you could have like a, a cloud service uh, doing loans and seeing if you are able to get a microloan based on the purchases that you've done in that job for the last uh, five years. You can put some kind of like Irish scanner or a fingerprint and become a notary because now you know who's standing there in front of you and every store in the world can do services for others. Accept money, uh, receive money and because it has an app store, you don't know what the use case is going to be. We'll see that tomorrow when somebody becomes a new millionaire. Everything can be a base station. I see Mark came back. So, so basically, you just put this Lime SDR, put a 4G app, Wi-Fi, LoRa app, and you can create a base station. We showed that on Mobile World Congress, and you have an app store. Why would you want to do that? Well, bring those three things together. I have my vending machine, I have my base station, I can have mobile payment, crypto pay, uh, payment and so on. I can actually become a new economy. Put this in the center of an African country and basically through the vending machine I can buy a SIM card, through the SDR I can give service and through selling and putting money and having this like prepaid and so on, you can do what's called M-Pesa, for instance, in Kenya. You can have like your own virtual currency. But M-Pesa is like, I think, already more than 10% of the GDP of Kenya at this moment. So don't quote me on that one. My memory is vague there, but it's like a really important number in the GDP of transactions go through M-Pesa. So app enabling things, bringing things together that don't necessarily come together can change how economies work. How can you do the same with healthcare? Well, if you would have people sign an I will not sue you contract, give them like a health kit for your home or in cheaper versions, uh, or cheaper, uh, sorry, in, in uh, countries where like um, they can't afford it for the village and have remote doctors, you can basically have a doctor for $1. Compare that to the price in the US of going and doing a doctor's visit. And that home kit can measure everything, can even have a computer take all the vital signs and unless there's something wrong, you, you, pay, you talk to a human. So it could even be cheaper than a dollar. But we can go further. Why not make an open source MRI scanner? Why would somebody put the complex design of an MRI scanner open source on GitHub? Well, think about it. If I am better at designing something than like the number three in the market, but they're cheaper, but I'm not as good as number one in, in the market, what could I do? 
If I put my design out there, open source, all the hospitals in the world can go to Foxconn and say, we want 20 billion MRI scanners according to this design. All of a sudden, the price of the number two goes 10 times lower than the price of number three. So they can be cheaper. Because it has app stores on it, any use case can be defined. So from an innovation perspective, it beats number one. And because there's an app store, and that company that designed it controls the ecosystem of all the developers, even if you just are Foxconn and you made a perfect copy, without the apps, it's nothing. It's like having an Android phone without access to the Play Store. So, can we do it in energy? Yes, we can. You can open source it there, you can define things, you can like see where the, the future is going. Future will not be about the energy company giving us energy, it will be about us also generating energy and like doing transactions and so on. If you're going to like see the future and open source solutions for those type of things and create platforms on top for others to extend it, you can make solutions for those large enterprises and by the time they realize the economy has changed, they have no other choice than take your solution. What happens with an open source solution? Well, support, as was mentioned before, is a good thing. What can you do if you have a, a good open source solution for a problem enterprises just discovered they have and there's no compet a competitor because you started three years before building it when nobody saw it uh, as like a requirement from a customer? Well, the BT technical team will take that open source solution and put it in production because they don't have anything else. Or they will use it to write the RFP. We will get most points on the RFP answers if like, they use your solution to write all the questions on. So you can change those type of things in completely new ways. So how can you monetize open source? foresee the future. Don't focus on a problem with today's technology because you need some days to build it. So you'll have tomorrow a solution for yesterday's problem built on yesterday's technology. Not what you want to have. So you want to have a solution that is focusing on tomorrow's problem so that when tomorrow comes you have today's solution for today's, today's with today's technology. And you have to focus on things that are expensive. Think about this like going from product to commodity. MRI scanners, who would think about open sourcing an MRI scanner? But if you have a revenue stream, you can. Facebook is doing exactly this at this moment with their telecom infra project. They're open sourcing mobile base stations. We are working with EEBT on, on making sure there's app stores there. And then make some partners millionaires. If you have an app store on it, yes, your base station is empty when it gets there. Let BT decide which apps they want. And perhaps some apps are super proprietary, have been tested for three years and cost 10 million. No big deal. You get a revenue share on those 10 million and you didn't have to do an RFP process for them to decide which of the three apps. And because it's an app store, it's no longer like, let's do this complex project. Let's download it, see if this one is good, let's download the other one, let's download the other one, and then they say, oh, the open source one with like support actually is exactly the same as the other one. Why would we overpay? So, hope this was useful, so that you can innovate today, because otherwise you'll be disrupted tomorrow. <laughs>